glad to be here today with you. Um, just a few announcements, and I'm not going to go over all the detail, but uh, obviously you see the Change Your World bucket out there. Today, those ministry monies will be going to Spectrum, who we support in Tijuana, Mexico. Uh, there will be Go Deep starting again this week, so if you're involved in that, uh, join them Wednesday evening. Mark your calendars for March 23rd. There is a congregational forum at 7 p.m. Various things will be discussed, but also uh, new elders for our church will be looked at to be confirmed. Those are listed right below there in the bulletin. Bob DeBolt and Mike Arnold, most of you know them, I'm sure, but in case in the um, church update, there is uh, information about them if you'd like to read on that. Also, if you occasionally go to the March, the uh, Saturday services, March 13th, there will be no Saturday service. So please be sure you're aware of that. And so that morning, um, Sunday first service on that section of the building, I believe Shane said, would be masked only. So the rest over here, no need to wear masks if you're not into that. But if you want to wear masks, it will be on that side of the building. Um, so that those folks that normally come on Saturday are, feel more at ease to come. Also, uh, looking ahead for Easter, we will be having a sunrise service at 7.30, but we will not be providing that normal breakfast uh, meal that you're used to, so um, just keep that in your uh, awareness. Then, a couple of things that are coming up. First of all, if you would like to be of help, the Calderwoods, Jeannie is up here. I won't make her wave or smile at you or anything, but the Calderwoods have an opportunity to move into a house of their own and that's happening this Friday. So they're asking if anyone is able and willing. Friday at five o'clock if you want, if you're willing and able to help them, um, look Jack up on Breeze and give him a call. Then today, after the second service, uh, we're gonna be looking at what children's ministry might look like in the near future. And I say might because it's not just up to me, it'll be up to the community. And so. We're looking at doing something called a missional community that has an eventual outreach to children's ministry. If you would like to know more about that, uh, come back at about 1230. We'll be meeting in the middle basement. We're having a lunch. There will be a main meat provided, and we're asking people to bring a side dish. Um, and even if you don't come and eat and you just want to hear, that's also good. I just want to make sure everyone that is interested gets to know about that. Last thing to mention is uh, Saturday, March 6th, so this Saturday. If you enjoy bowling, I, enjoy, I encourage you to come join us at the Strike Zone from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock. We're going to be there with as many Lockwoodians as we can fit in the building. And uh, so I hope you can join us for that. And then one last thing, I forgot almost. Uh, so if you know Ben and JC, Ben and JC, well, Ben didn't have it. JC had a baby this Thursday. Name is Martin William Miller seven pounds and some odd ounces and uh, so congratulate them if you see them or message them if you could pass the registers that would be great and we're going to worship our lord The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great. Age to age he stands 
and time is in his hands beginning and the end beginning and the end the Godhead three in one Father, Spirit, Son the Lion and the Lamb the Lion and the Lamb how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise, my heart will sing how great. Name above all names, you are worthy of all praise. My heart will sing, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are come to you as sinners saved by grace. And Lord, we welcome you to Lockwood Community Church this morning and, and uh, pray your blessing upon our service. Lord, we pray that uh, you would clean our minds and clear our minds of all distractions, that we might focus our attention on, on you. Lord, you are such a great God. There is no one like you. And Lord, we thank you for the uh, reconciliation process that you made a way for us to have access to you Amen. through the spilled blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And Lord, we from our spirits say, how great is our God? And Lord, we also say that you are, our, you are my Lord and you are my King. Lord, as we consider you from our spirits, from our souls, May we well up with joy and well up with thanksgiving, for we come as grateful people saved by grace. So, so high in the 
exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. I'll never know. say this verse open my eyes that I may see wonderful things open the eyes of my heart Lord open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see. Accepted. 
you work in them. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You are my king. You are my king. Jesus, you. seated. Amen. <clears throat> praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels holy name like a shepherd Jesus will guard his children in his arms he carries them all day long praise him praise him tell of his excellent greatness praise him praise him ever joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. our blessed Redeemer, heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring, Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever, crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king, Christ is
Our main text is from Matthew 6 today, but I'm going to share several verses from different places at first. This is, this is Jesus in Matthew 6. No one can serve two mas- masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now this is Jesus in Luke 12. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Now this is St. Paul. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. Now this is James. Now listen, you rich people. And as I read that, I need to remind myself and all of us that we are very rich in this country. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. And now back to Jesus how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. These verses are just a small sampling of what the Bible has to say on the topic of money. Now it needs to be noted, the Bible never condemns wealth, but only greed for riches and the love of money. Money is not sinful, but money is dangerous. It's dangerous to the person who longs to live their life completely for God. The danger of money is that it has incredible power to distract us from our single purpose, which is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. There are some Christians, I believe, who are called by God to live a life of poverty. And there are others, I think, who are given great wealth to build up the kingdom of God and bless people in God's name. But whether we have money or not, we are all called to live a life of simplicity. By simplicity, I don't mean becoming a minimalist or having a garage sale and decluttering your house. I don't even mean being simple as in like growing your own vegetables or only owning two pairs of pants. I mean being simple as in being single. Single in our purpose and undistracted in the way we live our life. But in order to do this, it is necessary to be freed from the rat race that defines American culture, which is the rat race of accumulating newer and better possessions. Until we can become detached from this kind of life, we are always gonna struggle to become completely attached to Christ. Dave Ramsey, a lot of you have heard of him, he said that each thing we're attached to ties and binds us closer to this world and not heaven. And it seems clear to me from both from reading the Bible and from just observing the world that the more possessions you have and the more of yourself that you invest in them, the harder it is to follow Jesus. Jesus gives us a picture of what the simple life looks like in Matthew 6 when he says this. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So the reason that we're told not to worry is twofold. First is, God meets the needs of those who belong to him. That is very simple for God to do. But the other reason that we shouldn't even be mindful of things like clothes and food is that we have bigger fish to fry in this life. We have a kingdom to seek. Who cares what we eat and what we drink and what we wear as we go out to find it? The life that Jesus calls you and me to is a life of such unimaginable glory and gain that to run after things, small dainties like food and clothes or even houses or cars 
is below our dignity. Who would spend so much of their time and their thought and their effort to have an easy retirement or to get a nice house or to eat out at fancy restaurants when we will receive the kingdom of heaven and eat at the banquet feast of the Messiah? So practicing this kind of simple life means living a life of freedom, not only from the need of things, but even from the want of them. Some people think that if they have very little or if they don't get paid very much, they're living a simple life already. Or they think that if they don't have good things, then that means they're living a simple life. But we can be very poor and still not live the simple life that Christ is calling us to. In fact, poor people are often just as consumed with things as rich people. A simple life is a life that is narrowly focused on God and his kingdom. So narrowly focused that material possessions don't usually even cross our minds. And when we live this kind of life, we will inevitably find that God meets all our needs and even all of our desires. The follower of Jesus is following him to a point in their life where they're able to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, David didn't say that because he had every single material possession anyone could possibly have. David said that because God had already filled up the only desire that was in his heart. Things in and of themselves have no value to the mature Christian. They are neither here nor there. If they're helpful for following God and delighting in him, they're kept. And if they're not, they're let go. But either way, they are never treasured. But most of us, probably all of us, are not to that point in our lives yet. There are things that have the hold on us, houses and cars and clothes and technology and golf clubs, things we don't even own yet. We live in a country where people have swallowed the lie, bait, hook, and sinker, that more and better things could somehow make for a better life. That is a lie. Every single t commercial on TV is selling that lie, no matter what the product might be. The lie is that life can somehow be measured in an abundance of one's possessions. Even many Christians have never considered that they might be building their lives and their hopes around things that money can buy rather than on God. And when they do that, they're living their lives just like everyone else. And when you're living your life just like everyone else, you are not living your life like Jesus. That goes for what we buy and what we own as well. The American dream is not, and it can never be, a Christian's dream. The American dream and the word of God are at odds with one another. The American dream says, if I work hard enough, I can have everything that I ever wanted. But the word of God says this, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. The American dream says, I have the opportunity to get the career I want and the house that I've always longed for. The word of God says this, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. I think we need to ask ourselves this question. Is my lifestyle and are my spending habits a good reflection of the life of Jesus and the life that he calls his people to live? We have a kingdom that's being conferred on us. Why should we try to live like royalty now? We have true riches that will be entrusted to us. Why should we run after a shadow of the real thing. In the year 251 AD, 
there was a man named Anthony who was born to a well-off family in Egypt. And when he was 18 years old, Anthony was in church, and he heard the words of Jesus to the rich man in Matthew 19, go sell what you possess, give to the poor, and come and follow me. So immediately after the church service, he gave away all the land that he'd inherited from his uh, recently deceased parents. And he sold all of his possessions, and he gave the money to the poor. And then he left the village where he lived, and he spent the next 20 years in the desert by himself. Now, they call Anthony the father of monks, because by the time he was old, many people followed his example. And they called those people the Desert Fathers. The Desert Fathers were marked by a complete detachment from a desire for material things and extreme simplicity of lifestyle. They renounced everything except the simplest food and the plainest clothing, and they owned nothing else. And they renounced things in order to know what it meant to have a single eye, to have one purpose in life. There's a story about the Desert Fathers that a rich, important man gave a basket of gold pieces to one of the priests in the desert as a tithe, and he asked him to disperse it among the other priests and monks there, all of whom basically had nothing. But the priest said, they have no need of it. The rich man insisted. He left the, the basket of gold pieces at the doorway of the church and told all of the priests and brothers to take it if they had a need. But no one touched it or even bothered to look at it. Can you imagine if Publishers Clearinghouse or the Michigan Lottery or something came to your door with balloons and cameras and a giant check for millions of dollars and you could simply say, thanks, but I have no need of it. That doesn't come when you already have millions of dollars. That comes from a heart like this. That is the kind of people that Christians are destined to become. People for whom the lust and attraction of money and things has absolutely no grip. That's why Paul can say in 1 Timothy 6, 8, if we have something to eat and wear, We'll be content with that. What a beautiful statement. Now, certainly, money and possessions are a necessity of life. We can't live like the Desert Fathers. It doesn't work that way here. Jesus even makes that clear. Your father knows you need them. He knows that you need these types of things. But there are things that we need to keep in mind when we're dealing with worldly wealth. The first thing is this, our God is both fabulously rich and incredibly generous. How foolish it is to believe that we can receive money or things from the world that were not already his and at his disposal. God could drop millions of dollars in your lap if he so pleased. And if he doesn't do that, shouldn't we assume that we can get by just as well without them? He will provide what we need. I think most of us, especially you who are older, have witnessed to the fact that God has met your needs, right? He has met your needs and even more so. The second thing is this. We need to remember that while God richly provides all things for our enjoyment, as 1 Timothy 6, 17, true joy does not come from the things provided, but from the one who provides them. If we're looking to gain pleasure from things that we don't yet possess, we are sure to find that when we actually attain those things, they cannot give us anything we didn't already have. If we are not content with the good things that God has given us now, we won't be content when we get more either. Third thing is this. Is this really the time is this really the time to be storing up good things for ourselves? The New Testament tells us these are the last days. These are the last days. There's a spiritual war going on, but the rebellion is almost over. The kingdom is almost here. The king will be coming soon. The world in its present form is passing away, and money and possessions will pass away with it. We must not get distracted or lose sight of this. So, 
What does this mean practically in real life when it comes to how we live our lives? What specific changes should we make in how we view money or spend money or use our possessions? What does this simple life of seeking God's kingdom first look like for each of us individually? That, I think, is not something that can be answered in the sermon, but only by the leading of the Holy Spirit in your heart. But there are three principles that I want to draw from the different scriptures that we've, we've talked about that I think will help us uh, know what to do. First principle is this. The goal of a Christian's life should match the goal of his money. The goal of a Christian's life should match the goal of his money. The worldly man's goal is to please himself in every way possible. So naturally, he makes his money serve that purpose, whether through hoarding or through spending. But the goal of our lives is to love God and know God and please God in all that we are and do because he bought us with his blood. Our money should be a tool to meet that goal. Do the things that you possess help you to meet the goal of loving and knowing and pleasing God? If not, get rid of them. Do your financial plans for the future fit the holy life that God has called you to? If not, change your plans. And what's true of the individual Christian must also be true of the church. The goal of a church should match the goal of its money. A church that is overly concerned or overly enthusiastic about finances is probably a church that's lost sight of the true goal. A church must be faithful with money by filtering every bit of it toward the goal of loving and knowing and pleasing God, whatever that might look like. Second principle is this. If you seek the kingdom of God first, everything else, including your money, will fall into proper order. Overspending or compulsive hoarding are symptoms of a deeper problem. It shows that our loves are disordered. It is not wrong to say, want your house to be nice. It's not even wrong to have a nice house at all. It's not wrong to go on vacations. It is wrong when you love your house or your vacations more than you love Christ. That disorder of affections, that disorder of loves will show itself when we're more eager and willing to use our money to benefit our selfish desires than to seek the kingdom. Our money follows our deepest love. It always works that way. Just like our thoughts and our time follows what we love most. It doesn't do good to feel guilty about how we use money. Real change in this area comes from how you order your loves. Put Christ and his kingdom first in your heart and your money will follow suit. The third principle is this. Earthly money, when, it, when it's invested in the kingdom, receives heavenly returns. There's a very sweet woman in our church who gives my kids money for their birthdays. And Finn turned six in December, so he got $6. And for Finn, $6, $6 bills equals six toys at the dollar store. For those who are seeking God's kingdom first, money equals opportunity to invest in the kingdom of God, to offer hospitality, to help the poor, to love your family, to serve the church, to bring glory to God. The returns they get from this investment of money come at incredibly good rates. Jesus promised that they'll not fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age and in the age to come eternal life. I'm reminded of George Mueller. Mueller is famous for his principle of never asking men for money but only God. And over the course of his life, Mueller cared for the needs and educated over 10,000 orphans. He never once fundraised or petitioned for funds, but he simply asked God when he had a financial need. 
Sometimes he didn't even have enough money to put food on the table for himself or the orphans. But God would provide even sometimes the very hour that he would pray. What's amazing is that through the years, God funneled over half a billion dollars in today's money through Mueller's hands. Half a billion dollars. And Mueller used that to reap incredibly good things for the kingdom of God. Mueller was never personally wealthy himself. But consider the spiritual returns on, that, on his investments. Money equals opportunity. The question is where we'll invest it. I like how John Piper put it. He said, a $100,000 salary or a $500,000 salary does not have to be accompanied by a corresponding $100,000 or $500,000 lifestyle. That's the American lie. God is calling us to be conduits of grace and resources, not cul-de-sacs. We have a high calling, which is to live a simple life that is focused completely on God and his kingdom. Let's not become distracted from that calling by money and things that can't bring true satisfaction. So set your hearts and your minds on Christ, and when he who is our life appears, we also will appear with him in glory. Let's pray. God, this is a hard topic, and it's hard to even know what to do with your words about money and about things. We live in a culture that thinks so differently from you about these things. So I pray for your spirit to awaken us to the calling that we have to live completely for you. Lord, would you help us to know how to be wise in these matters and to please you in all things. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There should be prayer helpers up here, maybe. If not, I'll stay up here uh, if you'd like to pray with me. Um, and besides that, I, you're dismissed. Have a good day.